Welcome to Sputnik, orbiting the world with me, George Galloway. And me, Gayatri. It sometimes seems as if there are two Donald Trumps. The one whose election campaign portrayed him as the man to end America's endless involvement in costly, ultimately failed foreign intervention, invasion, war and occupation. Resetting relations with Russia, not to mention reviving the Rust Belt at home, was Trump's mantra. And then there's the other Donald Trump, whose forces are currently mustering in South America, the South China Sea, the Black Sea, and now the Persian Gulf. Some of these confrontations were obvious, but not many people expected that for the first time since the Bay of Pigs nearly 60 years ago, the US would have a government that seemed actually serious about attempted regime change in Cuba. Joining us to discuss this sea change is the director of the Cuba Solidarity Campaign, Rob Miller. Rob, welcome back on the Sputnik. Are people in Cuba worried about this? They've uh, seen the change in, in rhetoric and more than rhetoric uh, in uh, Venezuela. There's not been an invasion yet, but there might be. Do people worry in Havana the same thing might happen there? Well, I think absolutely people in Cuba are worried. I mean, they're worried about their futures, they're worried about the economy, and they're worried about uh, having access to the things that they want in life, food, uh, milk for the children and so forth. And these sanctions are serious from the United States. They've been serious over the past 60 years, and they are now going to become even more serious. And so there will be an impact on the ground in Cuba, and already the government and uh, people in Cuba are discussing uh, the possibilities of shortages and so forth. That's what sanctions do. Sanctions are there to try to strangle an economy. And when the blockade uh, was started by the United States back in the 1960s, it was there to strangle the Cuban economy in an attempt to force the population into uh, a desire for regime change. Now, with these, uh, the new measures being put in place by the Trump administration, which will strengthen the blockade, there is a concern. But, and it's a, a very important but, Cuba has been through some very serious times. In the early 90s, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, they experienced a special period. And that has given the Cubans a resilience, an ability to withstand such external pressures. So we, we have confidence that the Cuban people will be able to withstand uh, these sanctions. It may be difficult, but united a people are very strong. And I think the Cuban people have shown over the years that they are a united people and they're very strong and they will stand up to defend their gains and their revolution. There's sanctions and sanctions, isn't there? I mean, um, refusing to allow the importation of Havana cigars is a sanction. Uh, but this new order of sanctions is not just now uh, impacting on the people of Cuba mm -hmm. in the way that you mentioned, but everyone else around the world uh, who What's almost the seems as if, they, if you write the word Cuba mm -hmm. on the internet, uh, you'll be sanctioned. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the blockade has always been extraterritorial. So companies in third countries, such as Britain and Europe, yeah. who trade with Cuba, can be sanctioned and fined. And companies have been fined uh, billions of dollars over the years. Uh, companies such as Lloyd's Bank, exactly. Barclays Bank, uh, etc., have paid hundreds of millions of dollars in fines to the US Treasury. How is that even legal? Well, it's... Uh, <laughs> It's the, the power of the United States economy, the power of the dollar, that the US says, uh, if you trade with Cuba, then you cannot trade with us. So companies make a choice. Will I continue my trade with little Cuba, or do I want to continue trading with the world's biggest uh, economic powerhouse, the United States? The problem right now is that the United States have enforced Title III. It's called Title III of the Helms-Burton legislation, which was first passed in uh, 1996. And by enforcing Title III, what they're doing is they're allowing Cuban Americans, who were Cuban citizens at the time of the revolution in 1959, who have now become American citizens uh, 60 years later, to be allowed to now make claims against Cuba, but also against international companies. So think about that. It's like uh, you, you change your nationality. At the, time, at the time of the revolution, they were Cubans, and, yeah. and governments have the right to negotiate with their own citizens about properties and offer compensation and so forth. And now you have foreign nationals who are now being able to sue the Cuban government over property that they owned in 1959. And that is completely against all international well, law what at the then? moment. What happened then with the property then? Well, in 1959, a lot of the richer Cubans, the, the, the aristocracy, if you like, the people yeah. around Batista, the plantation owners, the factory owners, the big mansion owners, 
decamped to Florida, to Miami, particularly at the time of the revolution, in the hope that maybe a few months later they'd be able to return and reclaim their factories and their lands. And so for 60 years they've been harbouring mm. this bitterness, this real sense of uh, hatred towards Cuba, a country which they believe has stolen their property or their ancestors' property. And they want that back. They nationalised it. They nationalised it. In, in essence, they nationalised it. They left. These were empty properties. Yeah. So they took them over, and they're now schools, they're hospitals, uh, they're producing Havana Club rum instead of Bacardi rum. But, of course, you have this bitterness that's built up over many, many years. So you're saying these people can now sue the likes of Barclays Bank or Lloyds Bank or any other big corporation mm -hmm. uh, to get their money back for their property that was nationalised perfectly legally in by Cuba's government Absolutely. in 1959. Yeah, and the Cuban government has uh, given compensation, and, and all countries around the world have negotiated compensation agreements. The only country that hasn't is the United States. Yeah. So now you have a situation that even uh, companies here, such as Tate & Lyle, the sugar company, yeah. or Virgin, for example, who fly to Havana, could potentially be subject to lawsuits. They will have claims made against them, because if you're a Cuban-American, you will use the courts, a no-win, no-fee wow. uh, chance. Mm. You're going to put one in on the off chance that you're going to be able to get millions of pounds. Now, if you're an international company looking to invest in Cuba and you're faced with hundreds or thousands of lawsuits, that is going to put a serious block on your uh, well, that's the possibility. Intention, that yeah. is the uh, exact intention. I mean, even... Uh, didn't you, uh, I saw right the other day about something on eBay? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, a woman just the other day, uh, it's one of many examples, she put up a small Cuban bracelet that she'd bought in Cuba a few years ago. She was selling it for 99 pence on eBay. And within hours, eBay had contacted her wow. and threatened her to take down all of her uh, items on sale there if, if she, you know, and they would take her whole site down if she didn't uh, remove the Cuban object that was trafficked goods. And the same is true if you want to sell Cuban honey, you want to sell Cuban coffee. I mean, even bars across Britain that are selling Havana Club rum could, in, uh, in all likelihood, be faced with such claims in the near future. But, like, even Havana bars, there are plentiful. There, we've got plen there are plentiful, these Absolutely. Havana bars. It's insane. It it's many insane. people will think this is uh, 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 absurd, but, of course, it's, uh, it has the very practical effect that, uh, that you talk of. On the other hand, I'm sure I saw the next king of England cavorting in Cuba uh, just a few weeks ago and his good wife uh, addressing meetings of Cuban women communists. Britain has uh, actually now quite good relations with Cuba. Britain has, a, has no sanctions whatsoever with Cuba. We have full diplomatic and trading relations with Cuba. We even have uh, organisations funded by the British government to promote trade with Cuba. However, British Cuba trade is at a very, very low and paltry level. And so we re would really like the British government to do more than just vote against the blockade of the United Nations, uh, to do more than just have uh, laws to protect British companies, but to actually use those laws to protect British companies that want to trade with Cuba. Only, only a couple of years ago, the Open University banned Cuban students from applying in this country mm -hmm. because of the blockade legislation. And this is going on all the time. eBay is one example. PayPal, WorldPay, Eventbrite, these are all companies. If you use them and put the word Cuba online for any uh, payment services, Even though they, Prince will, Charles is they will shut visiting. you down. Now, Prince, the British government, and uh, it was brilliant. I mean, he's now my favourite royal. For sure, uh, he had a well, wonderful give time. A chance. He's just been born. <laughs> he had a wonderful trip, and Camilla had a wonderful trip. You could see that from the the, the, the footage in yeah. Cuba. A wonderful place to visit, and it's very good that the British government and Alan Duncan has said yeah. we will uh, oppose these extra extraterritorial attempts to block and punish British companies for trading with Cuba, and we want to make sure that they those words are turned into real actions to make sure that the American administration understands that Britain and the European Union and com countries around the world will not tolerate the fact that a third country, the United States, is trying to impose its laws and its rules on third countries. It now becomes an infringement on our sovereignty, our country's sovereignty, okay. not just the sovereignty of the Cuban people. Finally, Donald Trump. Do you think if he was left to his own devices, he wouldn't be necessarily doing some of these things? 
Absolutely. Do you think the problem is this cadre around them? Of you have to remember that before, before he was elected, Donald Trump himself was exploring op uh, business options in Havana to build hotels mm. as part of his own hotel chain. Mm. So he's not opposed himself to international trade with Cuba or other countries. Yeah. But right at this moment in time, he's in a tricky position. His uh, administration is full of uh, people uh, like Marco Rubio, who have come from a Cuban-American hardline uh, right-wing position. And they have an influence because votes, as I said, in Florida are very important. But also you've got, uh, as we can see, the Trump uh, administration are looking for fights around the world. Mm. And Cuba, Venezuela, in the region, they, they uh, uh, deflect from some of the domestic situations that they face. And Trump needs friends in America and it's a way of uh, building his, his support. So it's, it's, it's a political decision, and obviously pres presidential elections uh, coming up in a couple of years. The, yeah, the, the regime change uh, in Venezuela has manifestly failed, leaving a lot of people with egg uh, on their face. Uh, a lot of European governments very angry that the US led them to believe... Well, Trump himself was very angry, <laughs> of course. Yeah, to uh, uh, I mean, and his it, people. It, it's been a fiasco, I think we can... <laughs> we used to call the Bay of Pigs a fiasco, <laughs> but the Venezuela coup was uh, uh, pretty much a fiasco. Um, it would be a very big ask for the US to invade Venezuela. I think we both know, don't we, that invading Cuba would be uh, the mother of all catastrophes for the United States. Absolutely. I mean, Cuba is a very unified and a proud nation, and they've had 60 years to build that pride in their country and that determination to defend their gains. And they're very real gains in health, in education, internationalism. The Cuban people are a happy, uh, excited population about the future of their country, and they want to build a better country for them and their children. And they're certainly not going to bow down to these threats. Uh, from the Trump administration. And the idea at the moment that uh, you know, Cuba is propping up the Venezuelan regime is it, just uh, the lies that are emanating out of Washington. The idea that they've got 20,000 troops over there, they've got 20,000 doctors and nurses. That's what he meant. Who are helping uh, the Venezuelan people, just as they're helping people around the world. 60,000 Cuban medics are currently serving around the world in the poorest parts of the poorest countries, more than the World Health Organization and Medicine Sans Frontier put together right. right now, helping people around the world. And that's the Cuba we want to respect, and that's the Cuba that we need to show solidarity to at this particular time. Rob Miller, thanks for joining us Thank on you. The Sputnik. Come up